deep theological water, they ask him, what's the most profound truth you've come across? He looked at me and said, well, that would be Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. It's great to have our friends Brad and Jeanette Swigard from Bartlesville with us today. He pastors the Grace Church there and you may recognize that he also leads the Logos Speech and Debate Club here in our facility on Tuesdays. He's on sabbatic. We're glad to have you folks with us today. God bless you for being here. Turn your Bibles please to Mark chapter 6 verses 7 to 13. If you don't have your Bible, we'll have the text on the screen. I much prefer for you to look at it from your Bibles, uh, just so you'll see that it, it is indeed there. It'll familiarize you with the passage around it, hopefully. Mark 6, verses 7 to 13. We're, we're back to preaching through this, uh, studying the Gospel of Mark, the Gospel in Action. The Gospel in Action. I would remind you, we haven't been here since... Thanksgiving, there's these words all through the telling of the life of Jesus. It then, next, immediately, it gives you a sense of hurriedness, of, of pursuit. Mark wasn't so interested in telling the circumstances around the birth of Jesus. He does tell some, but he didn't, he didn't dwell there. Jesus burst on the scene in Mark in his ministry, hurrying to the cross. And so, as we're thinking through this portion today, verses, six, verses seven, to seven, 7 to 13 in chapter 6, Jesus sends out his disciples. I want us to think about what that says to us. We are disciples of Jesus Christ. We have recognized here, we've, we've established here, we've discussed here, we've voted here that we recognize that Jesus saved us to send us. He, he saved us to grow as disciple makers who will make disciple makers. And you're going to see a little bit of that in the text today. Let me ask you to stand with me as, and follow along as I read Verses 7 to 13, Mark chapter 6. And he called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not put on two tunics. And he said to them, Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if any place will not receive you, and they will not listen to you, when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. What have we just read together here? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. Let's hear it today. Let's ask, Lord, what will you have me to do? Where will you have me to go? But also let's recognize that he's already sending you. You're already going in a lot of places during the week. Let's go as disciples. Thank you. Be seated. Jesus Christ was, without doubt, the quintessential teacher, mentor, and disciple maker. He said, come, follow me. He said that before he ever said, go. He says, come unto me. If you're weary, I'll give you rest. And he gives us rest so that we might be rejuvenated to go where he's sending us. It's been observed by some that Jesus' ministry among the twelve 
went something like this. I teach and do, you watch. So they would hear him teaching in parables. They would be spectators there taking it in. They would see him performing the miracles. And I teach and do, you watch. And the next phase would be, I teach and do, you help. Feed the crowd. Lord, we don't have enough food in this region to go find it and feed this crowd. But he engaged them in it. Next was you teach and do, I help. And this is where we're moving into when he begins to send them out. Then you teach and do, I watch. Then you teach and do, and a new disciple watches. That's the agenda. That's the way Jesus taught and made disciples. I would suggest to you that we don't have a better system than that. That's the best one. So look at the text with me briefly under these headings. Jesus sends out the twelve with derived authority. Second, Jesus sends out the twelve with dependence on him. Then he sends out the twelve with a keenness to reception and rejection. Fourth, he sends out the twelve with the call to repentance. And then finally, the fifth, he sends out the twelve with power over demons and diseases. Let's look at these real quickly together. First, he, he sends out the twelve with derived authority. He, he called to them in verse 7. He called the twelve. He'd already summoned them to go with him. Now he's, he's calling them together. Come, I have an assignment for you. He began to send them out two by two. Two by two. We know that from the Old Testament that two are better than one. If one falls, the other may lift him up. We also know from the Old Testament that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word is established. This divine genius, this divine wisdom in sending out two by two uh, proved very effective. Uh, going out two by two and witnessing things, observing things would keep you from ever becoming like say a nightly news anchor of embellishing some story of what happened if there was a, an accomplice with you, a fellow journeyer with you. They sent him out two by two. You know one of the things in marriage and Karen and I have talked about this throughout the 40 years we've been married. When it comes to communication, what you pray is that when a couple gets into a bad spot, you pray, dear God, please let one of us be clear-headed and clear-minded enough that we will know how to work this through, how to lead through with good communication skills. You pray, that'll be the case. And I can tell you, I can witness to you that after 40 years, that has always been the case. Now, it's hard for you to imagine Karen getting out of sorts, and it doesn't happen very often. I'm really the more inclined to get out of sorts. But all the way through, thus far, when one of us has gotten into a bad spot, emotionally, mentally, relationally, the Lord has always been kind that one of us would step up and say, okay, let's, let's, let's work through this. There's a value in two. The Mormons send out their young men two by two because they know if they send them out one at a time that they may happen upon the steps of some informed evangelical who can share the gospel with them. It happened to us years ago. I won't go into it in length, but they wanted me to assure everybody around me that they were Christians and that they believed the Bible and so on and so forth. So we began to talk. I said, well, let me ask you some questions. I mean, if you want me to be your representative, I need to be sure that that's true. And so as I asked questions, began to draw the scriptures into this. At one point, one of the young men said, when I quoted Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10, 
For by grace you are saved through faith, that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast, for we are his workmanship in Christ Jesus. You know the text. One of the young men said, where was that again? And the other one said to him, to this 18-year-old, elder, elder, don't ask questions. So two by two can even work to keep you from the light. Jesus implored it as a strengthening factor for the success of the mission. You go forward in the book of Acts, and the Holy Spirit, Spirit sent out two by two. There's wisdom in that. So I would just say to you, if you're, if you're on a mission to go talk with someone and it's at all possible, if you're going to share the gospel with them or minister the gospel to them some way, that if at all possible, have an accomplice with you. Two are better than one, Scripture teaches. But he, he sent them out two by two and gave them authority, gave them this, this power over unclean spirits. Until this point, they have been watching him exercise power over unclean spirits. You'll remember in, in chapter 5, the gathering demoniac. They observed that. And he gave them the authority. But it's derived authority. It's not, it's not something that they work up. Uh, like you hear these folks traveling around today, you know, the, with, with, their, with their healing ministries. This is something derived from him to be used for God's glory and to advance the name of Jesus. And we see the end of the text, and they apparently did that, just that. So, so they go with derived authority. That's the same for you and me. So, Pastor, I just don't, I don't, <laughs> I don't feel adequate. I don't feel intelligent enough. I, there's a lot of things I feel adversely about. Well, that's good. Maybe then we will depend upon derived authority. Once we know that, that our reservoir, by nature, is not full and is not full of strength, then perhaps we will depend upon Him, which you know in your Christian life, that's when, that's when amazing things happen. It's when you depend upon the Lord. My mentor, R.F. Gates, used to say, Bill, if you can explain everything that's going on around you, then it's a sure sign that God is not in on it. He gets glory unto himself in the usual by showing up in the unusual. Second thing I want you to see is he sends out the twelve with dependence upon him. Not only derived authority that, that he has told them they have this because he has granted them this. With dependence on him. Look how he sends them. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff. Right? That would be something they would, they would use to make it through the, the very bumpy uh, roads and, and trails of the day. And also it would become a, a weapon to fend off wild animals. No bread. No bag. That's, that is no, no clothes. To, no money in their belts. To wear sandals and not put on two tunics. Two tunics being... Uh, the covering so that if, if it, the weather conditions were, were such, you could shed one of them, but still have uh, ample clothing. But if it grew cold at night, which it did, put back one tunic back on him. He says, here's what you're going to do. You're going to go with a, with a staff, sandals, and one tunic. Now, brothers and sisters, that put them at the mercy of God from heaven's vantage point, and at the mercy of whoever they encountered along the way. And while I don't think it's appropriate to argue, well in that case, we ought to get rid of everything we have except the, one, the tunic and one change of clothes and don't go to Sam's because you don't, you don't go to Sam's to buy one day's worth of groceries, you go to Sam's to stock up. No provisions, no, no money. You don't make a one-to-one -one correlation here. You say, well, that's how we ought to journey for Jesus today. But the principle here is undying. Go in such a way that you will be absolutely dependent upon God. 
And I would submit to you that we have a hard time doing that in our day and time. We have, we have so many conveniences. I was telling a young lady, I think it was yesterday, we were talking to her, and when I was in college, I took some computer courses, and I remember we had to go over to the computer building. Now it was called the computer building because all that that building held was a computer. It was massive. We had little punch cards. If you, if you were going to college back in those days, you know what I'm talking about. If you took computer uh, classes, you take the stack of punch cards, you pray, you submit it, pray that it runs. And if one card is bad, it gets kicked out and you do it again. And I was telling the young lady, I said, what I hold here is so much more powerful than the computer that filled the room in my, in my college days. We have so many conveniences. We have so many tools. So we're not down on technology. We're not down on tools. What we are up on, however, is that we must, if we're going to be followers of Jesus Christ, live in an awareness of an utter dependence on Him. Some feel that more than others. Life has a way of pressing in upon us. It could be physically, medically. That God must move. It could be financially. It could be a relationship you're in that is, that is so painful, so hurtful. But it's never a bad place to be when you've come to be brought to utter dependence upon the Lord. That's good for you. That's good for me. So he, he sends them out with these... Things that are forbidden, things that are allowed. And I promise you, when they journey without bread, they're going to have to remember that he multiplied a lunch of a little boy, fed multitudes, that he will provide for them. And that, by the way, is their testimony when they come back. We'll look at that in a minute. So, Derived authority, any authority we have in life, is derived from the one, the all ultimate authority giver, God. Dependence on Him. Third, He sends out the twelve with a keenness to reception and rejection. He tells them this in verse 10, 11, when He said to them, whenever you enter a house, now that, that is predicated upon being allowed into the house. When you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. The, the, our, the International Mission Board speaks of these encounters in villages as encountering a person of peace. Not a believer, but a person who is not antagonistic to your being there. By the same token, we need to learn as good stewards, how to engage. And when we come to someone who is receptive, engage. Verse 11, if any place will not receive you, and they will not listen to you, when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. It is the, it is the symbol that the judgment of God is upon this place, and I don't want any particles from this place to be found on me. A keenness to spend our time, devote our time to those who we encounter them are receptive. And if they're not receptive, move on. Now we've got to be careful here. Just because someone rejects your gospel mission, your gospel ministry does not mean that they are rejected by God. It may be someone else who will come along and be the one who will engage them and they will respond in that setting. So let's not, let's not think so personally that if they reject me, well then they're, they're doomed for hell. 
It is true that anyone who rejects the gospel is already under the wrath of God, has the wrath of God abiding upon them, the scripture says, and should they leave this life, draw their last breath in that position, they will spend eternity in hell. But the point here is, recognize those you are engaging. I think sometimes we are unwise and spend an inordinate amount of time with those who will not listen. Those who are not open. Now we know from some of our friends who, who engage internationals that, that sometimes if you're, if you're a young woman befriending, building a friendship with a, with a Muslim young woman, it may take a year <clears throat> or two for them to have any comfort talking about your scriptures. So the point is not quickness here, it is keenness. Again, my friend R.F. Gates said it's like leading a horse to water, Bill. You, you stand by the horse and you, you coax him. You, his, he walks, you walk. He stops, you stop. Coax him. We need to be keen to recognize those folks that are just that way. And, and be hopeful that God is preparing them to receive the word that we're going to share, that we are sharing, that we're speaking to them and, and living before them. By the same token, don't waste our time having engaged people who reject us. You're allowing yourself to be captured time-wise by someone who is in the adversarial position this text speaks of. Verse 10 and 11, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. In other words, stay there as long as you're welcome there. And the ideal is that you would come into a house, these, these needy men, they didn't have any food with them, didn't have any means, they couldn't go to the local inn and, and pay some shekels to stay in a room. They were, they were dependent upon the hospitality of some. By the way, if you read about some international mission encounters in South America, I've read about different places where this is exactly what happens. They go into the village, someone takes them in, serves them the best food, stay with them to depart from there. And ideally, when you depart from there, you depart from a household that has been brought to faith in Christ. But if the place will not receive you, and will not listen to you, if you find no people of peace, no person of peace in this ar arrangement, this setting, then walk away and go on to the next challenge. We need to learn that for balance, brothers and sisters. Next, Jesus sends out the twelve with the call to repentance. So we're told that they went out just as they were told and they proclaimed, they were, they were carousoing the message, they were declaring the message that people should repent. Now, it should not strike us as odd that they preach that. That's the first word that Jesus came preaching. When he breaks onto the scene in Mark's gospel. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. John the Baptist, repent. Same thing. Why? Because the gospel is bad news before it is good news. It means very little to a person to, to receive or embrace a Savior who died for my sins if I am not aware that I am a sinner and if I'm not aware of what a terrible sinner I am. The word repent calls for change. It's the Greek word metanoia. It means a meta change, noia mind, a change of mind. No longer thinking my thoughts against God's thoughts, but now being brought into a line with God's thoughts. Where God says, you're doomed. You're condemned. A sinner condemned like me, we sing. Because when you, when you know and become aware of the bad news, then the good news that God sent his son to die for sinners becomes glorious news. 
So they go out proclaiming people should repent. That's not all that they said, I'm sure. But it tells us the lead function, the lead focus. It should be so for us. I think it was Arthur Pink who said, you have to get a sinner lost before you can get him saved. <laughs> you see, you don't, it's a big mistake today is people think they move, particularly if it's children, move from being safe to saved. No, we move from being lost to saved. And we have a God who is mighty to save. And so we see this example of them. They, they take the message he gave them. We don't monkey with it. We don't try to make it better. We don't try to make it clever. It is the old, old story of Jesus and his love. It is the, it is the faith once for all delivered to the saints that if we tamper with it, we do so at our own peril and the peril of our hearers. Fifth, Jesus sends out the twelve with power over demons and diseases. We said earlier he sends them out with this authority over them, this derived authority. But look at their testimony when they come back. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. This powerful expression, casting out demons, anointing with oil, sick being healed. They had seen Jesus do that. Get in their heads a minute. You have to wonder because we see these, these, this group of guys being of little faith over and over again, very much like we would probably be. Get in their heads as they go out two by two. They've seen Jesus cast demons out of a man into pigs. They've seen him heal time and time again. And he says, I'm giving you that authority. And they go wondering, can he do that? And would he do that for me? And this encounter they have at the end of this passage was as much for the affirmation that Jesus Christ is who he said he is, he does what he says he does, and he whom they had seen do these things now has the power to impart that unto them. Brothers and sisters, we shouldn't get bound up today in, in casting out demons and healing the sick. What we ought to get excited about today is that whatever the Lord wants to do with us, learn to rest in him with a settled confidence that if we bear his name, if we are now sons and daughters of the living God by faith in Jesus Christ, if we are Christ followers, then the Holy Spirit attends to us and attends with us. And Jesus himself said, when I send the Comforter, he will, through you, do mighty things that you have not even seen with me. Now there's some who tend to run to this and want to make, make everything about casting out demons, healing the sick. Parenthetically, let me say, if, if you ever meet somebody who has the gift of healing, who claims that, offer to buy them a ticket to Memphis, Tennessee, to St. Jude's Hospital. Now before we do that, we can take them to some of the pediatric intensive care areas around here just to let them warm up. We should expect, however, mighty things as we go in Jesus' name. If I go in my name, if you go in your name, we go in the name of Bethel. Hmm, probably not in my name, possibly in Bethel's name. But if we go in the name of Jesus, nothing is impossible. We don't put God in a box and okay, I did this, therefore you do that. Because there is a section in Matthew 7 where fellows did that to him. When he said, depart from me, I never knew you. And they would say, Lord, we, we, in your name we cast out demons. In your name we did mighty works. In your name 
We preached and prophesied in your name. You don't put God in a box. But we should enjoy the confidence and the liberty that he gives to us when he told them what he was doing. And their report is that many demons came subject to them and many who were ill were made whole. I teach and do, you watch. I teach and do, you help. I t you teach and do, I help. That's where they are. That's where they are. They're proclaiming the gospel two by two. They're engaging those with infirmities. I doubt they had to go looking for anyone possessed of a demon. It seems like in the Gospels, the demon-possessed person always found out where Jesus and his followers were and came to them. He sent them out. <clears throat> it is inevitable that as followers of Christ who are brought to Jesus, that as we grow as doers of the word, we will be more than observers. We will be disciples engaging in the name of Jesus. It's inevitable. Just I, My challenge as we leave is just look around you this, this afternoon, this week, and ask yourself, do honest inventory. Am I doing this in Jesus' name? I mean, it, it may well be that you can, that you, that you are. Consciously aware, what is it that I do, what is it that I say in Jesus' name as I, as I live and move and have my being by God's kind providence. I want us to be gripped anew and afresh with the responsibility and the privilege of taking the gospel of Jesus Christ to the neighborhoods and to the nations. And as Jesus sent out the twelve, so he would send out you and me to be his disciples who make disciples, who themselves make disciples, and the blessed privilege of sharing his name, no other name, no sweeter name, the blessed privilege of being sent by the chief physician to rescue those who are perishing, snatch them from the grave, from Sheol. You're a wonderful people. You minister in so many different ways. And no, I just want this, I want it to intensify. I want it to build. I want it to crescendo. I want this part of the earth to shake. Not because of fault issues north of us, but to shake because the power of God and the salvation so overcomes us and overwhelms us. Let's pray.